I love challenges and I am very attracted to tough conversations in general. So wherever there is resistance, I want to get messy in that. I feel like it's a sweet spot for me. And I do feel like it creates movement towards something better. Hello, listeners. I hope your day is off to a great start. Or if you listen to Wind Down at Night, may it be peaceful. Either way, I have a great guest for you today, Sarah Alvarado. She is a founding member of Alvarado Realty and the co-founder of Own It, Building Black Wealth, a nonprofit committed to increasing wealth for black and brown families through financial literacy and home ownership. She also wrote a fascinating memoir called Dreaming in Spanish, an unexpected love story in Puerto Vallarta. She is so smart and thoughtful, and let me tell you, she's kind of like me in that she does not shy away from discomfort, from courageous conversations. And she joins me today to do just that, to discuss taking responsibility, in this case as a white woman, as a woman who has privilege by default then, without taking on the weight of shame, which is ultimately not very helpful. I became an instant fan of hers from getting to know her through this conversation, and I can't wait for you all to hear what she has to say and maybe do what she suggests. I'm Emily Drake, and this is Who's Missing? We're here, I mean, topically speaking, to talk about taking responsibility without shame, blame, or guilt. You know, if I'm not mistaken, in going back and forth with Christina, my illustrious producer, this was your idea to talk about this. I love talking about this. We (laughs) talked about a lot of things. Christina is amazing. Isn't she amazing? I know. I'm so fortunate. Yeah. Okay, you love talking about this, and that I think uh, is not relatable. So let's talk about why. Why do you love talking about it? I love challenges, and I am very attracted to tough conversations in general. So wherever there is resistance, I want to get messy in that. I feel like it's a sweet spot for me, and I do feel like it creates movement towards something better. So not that we're going to figure it all out, but if we can even just be willing to get a little uncomfortable, that's where I really want to be. I I want to, on my deathbed, feel like I was part of living versus just living. Yeah. You mentioned this sort of like, it's, it's a superpower of mine. Tell us how you discovered having the superpower. And as with all superpowers, how it has... (laughs) blessings uh-huh. and curses to it. Right. <laughs> so yeah. I was just going with the latter, but um, <laughs> I've never actually really thought about where I, when I found out that it was a superpower. So I don't know if I'm going to have an answer for that, except that I've always been curious. And mm-hmm. when you're mm-hmm. curious, you're willing to get curious about things you don't know a lot about. I feel like our culture is all about don't say anything unless you know a lot about it. And if you don't, you know, like, don't say it wrong. Don't do it. Don't ask dumb questions. Yeah. I had a friend in college who I thought she asked dumb questions a lot. And I was always embarrassed on her behalf. And then I would get to like, see these amazing conversations. And she was just like, whatever. And I was like, I want to be like that. You know, you get to learn more. And it doesn't, it's not a reflection of who you are. It's just a reflection of what you've had access to. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would be weird if I knew everything right? Like it would be weird if we were to have conversations and I would have the right thing. Like that's just not a fun place to live anyway. Mm -hmm. It really came to be um, around 2014 when I started doing my own work around whiteness and me Mm -hmm. acknowledging my whiteness, um, how I was parenting. I have multiracial children and everyone said, you know, have uncomfortable conversations. And I was like, what is that? Like, okay. Mm -hmm. So that's probably when it really started. And since then, you know, now I'm here for 
all kinds of uncomfortable conversations. Yeah. The work that I do in the leadership space, there is, there's a lot of talk about having uncomfortable conversations. I'm sure that's a lot of what, I mean, it's what we're talking about, right? So practically speaking, tell us about what it feels like to have them, like before, during, and after. And maybe a little, if you have any thoughts on like how, the how, we'd love those too. Because I think everyone listening and and myself, I actually don't know right now and today if I have a difficult conversation I need to have, probably. But I'm sure many people listening are, we're all avoiding, we're avoiding it, you Mm -hmm. know? So how can we move toward it? Well, first it's gotta be intentional, right? Like we have to want, right? So I think when when there are conversations, and I'll use race and ethnicity as, as one, if we know that there's a potential for, right, like mm-hmm. Thanksgiving dinner and, and talking to your uncle, you can actually prepare and you can say, you know what, I'm going to be willing to step into an uncomfortable conversation. And then in having preparation, sometimes you can read an article so that you can bring it up and, you know, engage. And then you bring some tools, like how do I not get defensive? How do I meet someone where they're at? So you can actually do it that way, or I think interrupting. So if you are witnessing something Mm -hmm. that makes you uncomfortable, being willing to interrupt and say, hey, this doesn't feel right for me, or ouch, wow, you just said something that I'm not comfortable with. Like, you you can't Mm -hmm. say that, dude, (laughs) you know, like, Mm -hmm. um, so practicing it, but seeing it as a practice, I think is critical. Because if we go into uncomfortable conversations, needing to nail it, we are setting ourselves up for failing. If we're not used to having uncomfortable conversations, if we weren't raised in a family where that was welcome, I just really like to use the example of when a kid is learning to walk and every time they fall down, you cheer them on and you're like, yes, you know, get up. Like it would be weird if a kid started walking really well on their first time. So why do we expect ourselves to do anything well the first time? So part of it is being able to then after the conversation, take deep care of self because we're going to wake up in the middle of the night being like, oh my God, I should have said that. I shouldn't have said that. I can't believe I didn't respond with that. Like knowing that that's part of the process and then how do you handle it so that you don't give up? Because I see so many people like, you know, they're like all in and then they have a couple of mishaps and then like, screw that. I'm not like, I remember when I had that conversation that did not go well. I'm not touching that again. Mm -hmm. And that's a privilege, right? So if I'm taking responsibility, that's the definition of privilege, right? I can choose not to. Right. This piece about the deep care, you know, you seem as, as I would love to hear a little bit about kind of (laughs) the road to now and going way back, because I think what you reference about family, chosen family, the family you were raised with, that has a lot to do witnessing or not witnessing conflict. And is conflict really the same as a difficult conversation? And, you know, so many different ways we could go with that. Mm. But I want to talk about how you grew up recognizing the superpower and really putting it into action about 10 years ago, but having had it probably, it seems like your whole life is something you would say, or would you disagree? I think I played all the game. Like, I don't think I engaged in difficult conversations. Probably once I started dealing with my own trauma. So Mm -hmm. 24, 23, 24, I therapy, right? You, you, if you're in a therapist's office, you're going to have some uncomfortable conversations. So I would say that's probably where it started. Mm -hmm. But my mom was very open to, I mean, she, she was a social worker and a therapist and a counselor. So she was very open to having hard conversations. And I think my dad was too. There was a little bit more conflict in certain areas, but Mm -hmm. because you're right, I think that's really helpful, Emily, in terms of like difficult conversation and conflict. Like Mm -hmm. when I'm having an uncomfortable conversation, I'm literally wanting to listen as much as I'm talking and I do not want to win anything. I'm not trying to get anyone to believe what I believe. I'm just interested in for myself, can I engage in an uncomfortable conversation and not get defensive and not need to win? Like if Mm -hmm. I just go in it with those two things, Mm -hmm. I'm going to have a way different conversation than 
because of course I want people to believe what I believe. Yeah, like, right. duh. <laughs> duh. Yeah. yeah, that's the whole point. Yeah. But if right. it doesn't really work like that, then why is that what I'm shooting for? So this is an important distinction. I'm glad we've both come to it. You know, I sort of, it came to mind for me about why people were avoiding it. And then this thing you said about intention. So taking responsibility, having difficult conversations, all of this feels very adult as I'm saying it, right? And our intention in that makes it a difficult conversation versus a conflict. And I'm someone who also thinks conflict, you know, gets a bad rap. It's like something that we want to avoid. And I don't think well, I was going to say, you've done a lousy job of avoiding that, Sarah, if that was your plan. You've had plenty of it, right? I've had plenty of conflict. I'm also willing to back out when it gets heated because mm -hmm. I haven't seen heated get me anywhere. Emotions are information. So if I all of a sudden get really heated and upset because someone's like not hearing, I, I think that's helpful for me, but then I can also learn to like, is this going to actually get the conversation where I want it to go, which is really a meeting of minds or me learning more about this person, or this person might be willing to learn more about my perspective. I have to be in a position to assess and then dial it back or, or make a decision. Like it, it's not about being reactive. And when you mm -hmm. do get heated, it's hard. I feel like to not react. Yeah. You're making me think about how I'm new to having a kid in my life. It's wild to me. I have no wisdom. Well, I have plenty of wisdom to share. I don't know that I have anything new to share except to say that I've realized that my job is to regulate myself. It's like my only yes. job. I yes. mean, there's more, but it's, yeah, this is what you're talking about. Yeah. That's the most important job. And mm. we don't ever talk about that. Let's talk about privilege because you've brought up whiteness and I'm sure people are already like, oh boy. And then you bring up privilege. And I'm, I think that's the bracing for what has traditionally been a difficult conversation or difficult thing to talk about. And then we talk about privilege and there's another level of like, oh gosh, I don't have it as much in my body, but I do still have it. You know, um, the feeling that if we're going to talk about race, and we're going to talk about systems and we're going to talk about class. That's going to be hard, mm -hmm. you know? Do you want to talk a little bit about what makes you qualified to talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I'm white, so I should be able to talk about my whiteness. Um, <laughs> right? I mean, isn't it that simple? Yes and no, right? Like, um, right. I, I hear you. I think that people are mostly, when it comes up, worried that they're going to say the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Like, they might mm -hmm. not be scared to have a conversation about it, but they are scared of hurting someone by saying the wrong thing or looking mm -hmm. dumb or ignorant. Getting canceled. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So I think if we acknowledge that that's the fear, and then I sometimes will say, I might say something wrong. I, I, I might not say this correctly and then step into the conversation, mm -hmm. which is kind of an act of humility, right? Humility is mm -hmm. the absence of righteousness and getting it right and ego, et cetera. So if I can bring it down a little bit, then you know that I know I might mess up mm -hmm. and I'm a little nervous. And hopefully that can create space for whatever's going to come next. So what qualifies me to be able to talk about privilege? Mm -hmm. I have studied a lot. I have taken classes. I've gone to workshops. I am in multiracial relationships in work yeah. settings and personal settings. So my identifiers, I am a white woman. I come from middle class, educated family, educated in the academic sense. Mm -hmm. and financial privilege, able-bodied, cisgender. I'm married to a man. My husband is Mexican. We're raising multicultural children. I was raised in Judaism and Catholicism. I understand different cultures. I, I, don't, I don't know what qualifies me. I, it's a choice. I talk about it a lot. So mm -hmm. I read about it a lot. I study it a lot. I care about it a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm super passionate about it. And I would hope that People who are passionate about something are qualified to speak to whatever they're passionate about. Your trip to Puerto Vallarta. I started reading your book and 
that as 2014 sort of feels like this place where you've codified a little bit of where you started grappling with, you know, some of these identifiers. What about that trip? Plant the seed. What what was mm-hmm. what seed was planted to give you a new perspective? Yeah. So coming from the Midwest and I had been stripped for the for the listeners, um, the short story is I was struggling with alcohol, drug abuse, um, recent sexual assaults and was really trying to get my life back together or find a way to live in a healthy manner. But I had no idea what I was doing and how to do it. And I did the geographic thing switch Mm -hmm. and I, and I got on a plane and I went to Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, and I was going to stay there for a couple of months. And I ended up meeting Carlos who ended up to be my husband, spoiler alert, and unexpectedly got pregnant within a couple of months of being newly sober the concept of like making choices to change your life and then having things happen, like finding out you're pregnant that changes your life. That's like the big, the big stuff in the book. Mm -hmm. Right. And Mm -hmm. the second half of the book Mm -hmm. really addresses what it was like for me as a white woman who I had studied Spanish. So I was fluent in Spanish, but living in a foreign country as a white woman navigating a new family, new cultural experiences, and being faced with my whiteness and my privilege and my financial privilege and and community. And um, so there were hints of that. And that was kind of where a lot of seeds were planted. But the most challenging thing about writing this book, because I wrote it from that perspective of 24-year-old Sarah, Mm 25-year-old Sarah, Mm -hmm. and reading all of my journals and being like, do I include some of this embarrassing stuff or do I not? Because it's not, I mean, like, is it relevant to the story? Like, this is all these questions that memoirists ask themselves as they write. It would have been very easy for me to not include some of the things. And knowing what I know now, how critical it is for us to face and understand and to be able to see that it doesn't make me a bad person. Mm. I mean, our systems are created for us to not know, to not Mm. face to not address, to not change. It's counter to actually be like, no, I am going to look at this. And it makes, and and I might not look the greatest in doing this, but how else do we change? Mm -hmm. And then if people can see Sarah hasn't canceled herself, (laughs) you know, she hasn't like gone into a cave in embarrassment, you can see some of the ugly things, address it, change it, be a better person, do things differently. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it is biases, stereotypes, it's making assumptions, it's assuming that every Mexican wants to move to the United States, for example. Mm-hmm. That's not true. Yeah. <laughs> but on a, like, that's what I assumed, right? Like, yeah. And these are the things that, you know, were part of that process. How do I address some of those issues without taking readers out of the story? That was challenging, but I felt like it was important. Sarah's choice for today's spotlight is her own organization called Own It, Building Black Wealth. This nonprofit is a collaboration with Madison, Wisconsin area professionals in the real estate, banking, and financial industries. And their mission is a big one, to empower, educate, and guide black and brown families in building wealth through education and real estate home ownership. I don't think it's any small task to disrupt an entire industry that is really in need of it. To learn more, visit ownitbbw.com. That's ownitbbw.com. And now back to the show. I hear you saying I faced and understood things, which feels like taking responsibility, right? Like that you take up space, that you have a role, that you are who you are. Can you just tell us about the emotional adventure of that process? That was 2014 plus, right? Like I, when I was in Mexico, I would face some things and, and address it. And I did change as a human being, but we weren't having conversations about white privilege and racial profiling and So it wasn't until I was doing the deeper work in 2014 when we had more accessible language and books, at least I had access to it. I'm sure it existed. I just didn't. It didn't exist in my world, right? It definitely existed. But it wasn't part of my education. It wasn't part of my Facebook feed in 2000. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I didn't Mm -hmm. have one. (laughs) 
in 2014, when I was doing a wor- the work, I did battle with shame and blame and guilt 100%. Mm. And I do appreciate that there are different ways of learning now. And unfortunately, I was in spaces where that was the motivator. And I've seen mm. enough white women get out of doing racial justice work because of that. And that's, in my opinion, not working. Mm-hmm. I hear you. What do you suppose is the antidote to spaces that, I don't know, capitalize on blame and shame and guilt? What spaces should we be looking for? What kind of feelings, anything else? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is that is that a player? And if it's a player, yeah. if you can smell it, if you can see it, if you can hear it, walk away. Yeah. It's yeah. toxic. Mm-hmm. So what it also does is it disempowers, right? And sometimes white women are seen as having power that they don't know they have. Mm-hmm. And there's some broad brush strokes here, right? So everyone's yeah. experiences are very different. But there is a cultural norm of don't cry, don't speak, right? Like look pretty, but don't talk, whatever that little catchphrase is, be seen and not heard. And like this need for perfection. And so that actually takes us away from us feeling empowered to mm. speak up and be who we are and take up space as the oppressed and the oppressor addressing what it's like as the oppressed to like, okay, we also know what it's like when we are in situations where there is a male dominant figure who physically might, and we know how that feels. Mm -hmm. So that means we can also know what it feels like if we're in a room and it's a multi-racial room, how can I then switch it to be like, okay, so what can I do and how can I assess a situation? Mm -hmm. Another example is this call out for sit down and listen, stand up and speak out. White women specifically are being asked, do more, speak up, use your voice, use your privilege. And then at the same time, we're being asked to sit down and listen. You already take up too much space. It's not your time right now. Mm -hmm. And that is when it's easy to be like, it's too confusing. I'm getting too many mixed messages. I'm out. Yeah. The question I get is, what should I say in this situation? What should I do in this situation? I don't know because I'm getting mixed messages. Okay, now you're looking for an answer. What we're Mm. asking is that you look inside to trust yourself to assess, do you think this is the right time to step into this conversation? What will it take for you to trust your own intuitive hits on, oh yeah, I should probably be quiet now. I've been talking too much. So if we're shamed into don't say anything unless I tell you it's okay to say something, we're back in that circle of like, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. that's, that's my concern. There's so much courage in the path of taking responsibility or having accountability. I think it's just incredibly vulnerable to step up and say like, to make the mistake, instead of sitting down, you stand up and you say something. And then because of that experience, you get to feel whatever you need to feel to be instructive about how you show up in spaces. You know, I'm reminded of this, you know, the trusting yourself and how I think it's a really confounding thing. Like, how do we do that? You know, How do we trust ourselves? And I don't think you can. I'll just say this and you tell me if I'm wrong. I don't think you can without examining kind of what you've been through and who you are. I mean, I just, there's just no way to other way to do it. You know, that's totally it. Right. Which is why some of the work is do your own work on yourself first with your own (laughs) past, with all of your trust issues. That's first and foremost, you don't even need to step into this area yet. Go take care of yourself and be willing to do that work because those are hard conversations to have. For sure. So that's the good news. Yeah, you can do that. (laughs) Yeah, it's probably helpful to do that before, right? Like, for sure, it can be if people do get hurt, and there is cancel culture. And so if we are here for the collective good, we do want to protect hearts. In preparation for our conversation, I was doing some research and watched the um, the own it video, like I mentioned, building black wealth. There's so much that I love about the action-oriented nature of that organization. Can you tell us how it came to be? Tell us how it got there, right, as a way of normalizing that it was a journey, I'm sure. Yeah. 
there was a week in September in 2013. <laughs> we'll start there. And <laughs> someone was presenting the Race to Equity report at a luncheon. And it was an executive luncheon of women, which majority of the room was very white. And the last slide, you know, was like all of these horrible racial disparities and statistics throughout the whole presentation. The last slide was like, talk about it more. Um, and that was like the action item. And I was very disheartened by it. I was like angry. I was, I was the angry white woman that wanted to fix it. Um, this isn't okay, even though it's been going on forever. And it was my first time like really facing it. And then that Saturday, my, at the time, 12 or 13 year old was playing in a soccer tournament and he is more white presenting and he was mm -hmm. the goalkeeper. And one of his friends was the defense and he was darker skinned Mexican and the other team, Brian, who was the darker skinned Mexican, kicked the ball out and someone on the other team yelled, I hate Mexicans. And nobody mm -hmm. heard it on the sideline. But later that night, um, my son was telling my husband and I about this. I was like, what? People say that? Like, how could they say that? And I was getting all agitated. And Alex said he could tell, you know, he's like, oh, what did, what did I start here? He's like, but Brian didn't care. It was fine. We just wanted to play soccer. And I was like, what do you mean Brian didn't care? Like, what about you? Mm. So I took a, like, I chilled out a little bit. Like, I didn't go deep into it. But at, later that night, Carlos and I were talking. And, and I'm thinking, these are the conversations. Like, we're not having these conversations mm. at our dinner table. Like, I'm not talking to my kid because I'm, because everything is fine. Like, we're in a multicultural family. We're fine. We're happy. And we love everybody. And that's how I was raised. You just mm. love everybody. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that everyone is treated the same way. And so we hadn't been having those conversations at the dinner table. So I actually was like, I want to do this work for myself, not to be a better parent, because clearly if I'm not having these conversations and if I'm not reading and learning, then I'm not the person I want to be. And I see a lot of parents wanting to do this work to be a good parent and to teach their children well. And mm -hmm. I'm like, no, that's not how it works. Around that time, right, I'm starting to do more coaching of real estate versus selling as much, but I was still selling a little bit. And I got a call from a client who wanted to see like a $250,000 house. It was further away from where I was located. And she had a Spanish speaking accent. And so I immediately, I asked her if she wanted to speak in Spanish because I speak Spanish and she said no. So we continued the conversation in English but I was talking to her about the financing process. And after a while, she was like, I work at a bank. I got this. And I was like, oh, okay. But I had assumed she didn't know. Mm -hmm. And my husband is a very mm -hmm. smart Spanish speaking native. He has an accent, but I still immediately had this like, oh, I need to teach her. Mm -hmm. So that happened and I scheduled a showing for a Tuesday and this was a Saturday. And I got an email that same day for someone who wanted to see a $600,000 house close to my house and they had an Asian name and their signature was that they worked at the University of Wisconsin. Uh -huh. I scheduled the showing. I met the guy at the house. I toured it. Afterwards, I start talking to him about financing, assuming he knew. He knew nothing, had never been pre-approved. I mean, maybe he wasn't even pre-approved for 600000 but I took the time to go show him that house that day. Mm -hmm. Higher price, we get paid on commission. I was sick to my stomach. Mm -hmm. Like, I hear that. Yeah. I get emotional remembering how yeah. I was like, oh my God, we are gatekeepers. I am part of the problem. I know better and I'm not doing better. And I had all the excuses. Like, it was my kid's birthday later in the afternoon. I couldn't have gone all the way to Sun Prairie. Yep. You know, that house isn't going to go that fast. Like, I made up all the excuses and still I was like, yeah, this is not okay. So that was one of like the moments of gut punches where I'm like, we got to do better and we got to be honest about it. You then get to sit with that discomfort. Yeah. I mean, I can see it on your face. <laughs> By the way, discomfort, I feel like is such a broad emotion. There's so much grief behind it. There's There can be shame. There probably was some blame. And then, you know, it sounds like what you did is you moved into, I mean, maybe some guilt about it and then some action. Yeah. And I do think there is a difference between shame and guilt, right? Guilt yes, is like, for sure. oh, dude, I'm super guilty right now. I got to do something better and different. It's like when you're going grocery shopping and it's in the cart and it's in the bottom and you yep. didn't pay for it. And you go, oh my gosh. And you go back <laughs> in and you pay for it. Like that's guilt that moves you, right? right? Shame right. would be like, I'm a horrible person. In yeah. that case, there might've been a little bit of shame. I'm not going to sure. lie, but sure. I didn't want to sit in that. And so part of it is like, okay, there are so many resources for us to get better. 
How do we address our biases? How do we learn about biases? How do I even challenge my own biases? Like just that starting point of like, I don't want it to creep up on me because it's, it's cultured into me, right? It's not like I chose to be this person. It's like, these are the messages we get, the media, the it's all over. Mm -hmm. And we do have the ability to take responsibility and change it. So like, that's where the taking responsibility, I think is really critical. So then you're sitting, you, you hold the feeling, who knows how you cope well, how you cope maladaptively as you're going through all this stuff. And then you decide to take action and own it. Because a lot of it, I did need to do some of that personal work. I needed to work on the basic stuff yes. because the industry work is even more complicated and nuanced. And again, our industry doesn't want us to know half of the things, in my opinion, not because they're trying to, but it's just, again, it's like, why would we talk about these horrible things? Why would we talk about redlining? It's all history. Yeah. And yet it's not history when the numbers are the way they are. Like you can't mm -hmm. say if this law was changed in 1968, why is the wealth gap increasing? Why are our home ownership rates for black and brown families lower than they were? Like it's not history. There is modern day redlining and I did it. My action, and that was a practice. Part of the problem with the practice is our commission based. Am I going to work as hard on a $250,000 closing as a $600,000 closing if the model that I'm taught is to go after the bigger numbers? Like, how is our industry actually playing into it? Well, what if we created a balanced book of business? What if we looked at how we do business differently? How can we, even though we're still in a commission-based business, do business differently because we can't keep perpetuating the problem? And a lot of times realtors will say, well, I'll work with anyone. That's not enough. That's lacking a lot of insight about how our industry really works. So it was working with a more diverse group of agents. My sphere of influence shifted as I was more intentional about like, who are my friends? Who are my colleagues? And mm -hmm. as that grew, and then as I was able to hear, you know, where are their barriers? And then working in community with people um, and realizing, okay, this down payment assistance program is actually a barrier. How can we do something different? So own it came to be from pretty ugly, uncomfortable place. But then as I grew as a person, I was in a better position to address some of the policies and practices that currently happen. And then, yeah, and then you got to get creative. If you're a creative person, you think creatively about the problem and it's not just, oh, well, you can't do this because it's, oh, well, then how do we do this because? Mm -hmm. There's this move to action, but I want to be really clear with myself as I'm listening to you because I'm getting fired up. The, one of the first words you said, Sarah, was intentional. So I'm hearing a very intentional this feeling happened. I then spent this time being a curator of experiences for myself and my learning. And then it sounds like you got into conversation with other people, people who are white, people who are not white, and began to build something from that place. So this was yeah. not a knee jerk reaction. No, no reacting here. Yeah. <laughs> As I was doing this work, there came to a point where I was like, I, I, I can't stand the real estate industry. I've learned too much. I know too Good. much. I don't see how it's ever going to change. I want out. Good. And I, and I was actually at an event and I was presenting and the pre presentation was really focused on white women doing the work. Uh, and it wasn't mm -hmm. specific to real estate. One of the agents in our company sent me a text message and she was like, because I posted something about white women on the socials. And she was like, I'm a little upset by this. I'm white. We have clients that are white. Like I, I are you? Was, she was questioning, you know, how I was showing up publicly. I turned to this woman who was my racial justice coach and she was there. And I was like, I can't believe this. Can you believe, like I got all righteous and shamey. And I was like, I can't, I, I, I'm out. Like this real estate, like it's not, it's gonna shit, I'm out. Ananda turned to me and she was like, and this is why you need to be doing this work. <laughs> 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 like, and that was also a good learning experience of like, I was also her and I needed mm -hmm. to also learn how do I meet people? Like, I don't want to be all righteous about it and get to, I have to remember how it felt when I realized that I was part of the problem. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that long ago. It wasn't mm -hmm. that long ago. And I still mm -hmm. am part of the problem, right? Like, mm -hmm. and my mm -hmm. kids in 20 years are going to be like, mom, you really messed that up. Yeah. Guarantee you I'm doing stuff that's not necessarily regret because we're doing the best we can, but I just think about how my parents 
did such an amazing job raising me because yeah. they so believed like you can be who with whoever you want. Mm-hmm. They just missed that one piece and it wasn't because they meant to. They just didn't have access to it. It's a tricky thing with change and with pace because like it should be yesterday, right? The change and yet it's not. And so there's always this tension, I think, of the duality of, you know, and this is a privileged place to even think of, you know, doing it and continuing the marathon, but also being so pissed that it's not, it's not there yet, right? And using Mm -hmm. that, using that, regulating with that. I want to sort of end with this feeling that I had when you brought up whiteness and you brought up privilege and wondering like how people will receive our listeners, I think will can't wait to hear what you have to say next after you say those two words. But talking about the to the listener that is, you know, maybe overwhelmed, what advice would you have? Is there a small step? Well, I, I think it's knowing who you are. Yeah. Right. Like, are you the kind of person that wants to read a bunch of books and are more scared of taking it? So like I follow Barbara J. Love's concept of awareness, analysis, action, accountability, but that it's a circle and we're always going around it. Right. So for me, I know that I once I'm aware, I like to go straight to action Mm -hmm. and that's dangerous. Analysis is important. And some people stick around in analysis and that's the analysis paralysis. So part of it, again, is all the self-reflection and knowing, like, where do you feel comfortable? Where is your growth edge? Who are your people? Who can you feel comfortable? Uh, Start small, like have an uncomfortable conversation with the most comfortable person in the whole entire world. And maybe Mm -hmm. you hire that out. Maybe that is a racial justice coach. Maybe it is Mm -hmm. a therapist. Maybe it is going to a class where you're expected to not know. It's making the choice. It's being intentional. Yeah. Yeah. Circle. <laughs> yep. There it is. How open are you to talking to other white people about whiteness and privilege? Is that a calling of yours? Is that part of what you do? Is that I have had like white accountability groups. Um, yeah. Specifically for white women. I've definitely worked in that arena. Mm-hmm. Literally, mm-hmm. my book was just published in March. So I have been in that space for the last mm-hmm. couple of months. Education is is important. So yeah, I do offer sometimes spot coaching, sometimes one on one coaching. It's just an individual request. People can go to my website and check things out. All of this intentional work, part of me, um, because I hear this a lot in the work that I do is like, breaking free and having fun. Do you have fun? Let's just- Oh my God, do I have fun? If it's not fun, I'm not doing it. I really want to dispel the myth that this is dour. It's important, that's for sure. And as you're showing us so beautifully right now, Sarah, it can be colorful, it can be fun because you're flexing, you're moving, you're changing. This is good stuff. Yeah, I guess balancing fun out. I like to work with people where I can be me and I can be silly and I can be goofy. Yes. And, it, you know, like, don't take ourselves so seriously. Like, that is the worst. Like, we yes. really do not need to take ourselves so seriously. <laughs> Sarah, Sarah's got me feeling like I can do anything. So <laughs> I just, I'm I'm going to have to tone it down. No, I'm not. I'm not no, you're not. Down. Do not No tone way, it down. Jose. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So fun. Take it easy. Bye. As always, please hit that subscribe button so we can keep introducing you to these lovely people. It really does make a difference. And if you'd like, you can visit our website at whosmissingpodcast.com and be sure to follow us on social at Who's Missing Podcast. Thanks, y'all.